and talk a little bit about towing. Um, something that we've done, my family has done quite a bit of, um, not in the recent, recent past, but uh, we're gearing up for another season here pretty soon. So uh, what I did was just put together the most basic of slideshows. And I'm just going to kind of cover a couple different topic areas, if you will, and we can just talk about stuff as it comes up and have lots of other photos I could fish for if there's a question about something in particular. Um, but I should say, I guess, by way of introduction, also, I'm Stu Green. Uh, I do work as a policy manager at Ford, as Charlie said. I do still live outside of Ashland in Southern Oregon. Um, where the EV landscape is quite a bit different than our metro areas. So, any questions before I get going and try to figure out the slide share? Ah, Screen share. Uh -huh. Okay, well, just shout it out because I may not be able to see you. Um, <laughs> let's see. You should be able to see this screen. Okay. Can you see? Yeah, we have a yeah. We towing overview. Okay. We towing overview, and we see a screen uh, in the background that looks like uh, maybe a a uh, grape. Uh, it's a raft trail. Please. Yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully you can see it's 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 <laughs> just a my name on the bottom and EV towing overview at the top. So, um, so. As I said, this is extremely basic slideshow, but there's just three like main classes of trailers that we have used with the, our vehicle. And I should say we have a Model Y. Um, I can talk a lot more about the Model Y and why we got it. Um, we have used a lot of other rigs to haul with uh, that are not electric pickup trucks and forerunners and things like that. So we have some basis for comparison. But we've run like kind of lighter gear trailers um, for hauling rafting equipment. We've also run, pulled the 20, 21 foot travel trailer. Um, that's the one we've done the most trips with. And I'll show you lots of pictures. Uh, and then most recently, we got kind of a rigid pop up trailer, which is much smaller footprint. Um, so uh, here is the lightest trailer of them all. This is our gear trailer um loaded up as we depart on a rafting trip and this is actually you know this is probably a 2200 pound trailer when it's loaded up and i would say it affected our range almost not at all so the added weight for a trailer like this really didn't affect us um sometimes we pull it with the raft on top um obviously that creates a bit of a different uh, aerodynamic situation cuts down on range a little bit um, but we've hauled a raft like this you know a couple hundred miles no problem um, so you know i find as we've been towing the main thing is is the aerodynamic drag it's not so much the weight um, it's basically like having a parachute behind your car uh, mm -hmm. it's just a question of how big is the parachute um, so this is the trailer um, the 21 foot travel trailer that we use the most. I think we pulled this trailer probably, probably about 6,000 miles um, in the time that we owned it, um, which actually, full confession, I didn't own it. It was my in-laws trailer uh, and we enjoyed it a lot <laughs> and they barely took it out. So eventually it was sold, um, not because. <laughs> I'm sorry, what's the question? Well, the question was, what is the EV? And I identified it as a Tesla yeah, Model right. Y. So, um, so the Model Y, you know, I, we used to have a Nissan Leaf. Um, it goes to 2016. And it was great, but we really wanted an EV that had some range and that we could use for towing because we do a lot of outdoor trips. Uh, we do a lot of rafting. We do a lot of camping. And we just wanted to be able to do that electric. And the Model Y was the first car that could check all the boxes for us. Um, 
and that we could afford and I afford is kind of like questionable. Um, it's the only new car we've ever bought me and my wife. So it's a bit of a stretch for us, but we were very committed to the electric side of things and we were very committed to being able to tow also. So, um, <clears throat> let's see. So this is the trailer we used to pull with, uh, like I said, it's a 21 foot. Uh, it's made by this uh, Canadian company called Safari Condo. And if you can't really tell from this photo, but it has a very pointy, almost 45 degree angle nose. So it was really made to be aerodynamic. Um, and it shows, it really shows when you're pulling it. Um, here's a different view of that same trailer. You can see the nose in this one a little bit better. Um, <clears throat> we used it for boondocking quite a bit where I would work remote. Um, this was, I think, I think after lockdown, but pretty much everybody was still working remote at this point in time. So we took quite a bit of time to be out in the wilderness and fortunately had some cell phone boosters and was able to get a lot of work done out there too. So that was a pretty special time. And then the last trailer, um, as I said, this, this trailer we no longer own, um, which it was an amazing trailer. But we now have this much more modest uh, trailer for just my wife and myself and sometimes our kid. And it's a, it's a pop-up, like, A-frame style trailer. <clears throat> but it's really not built to be aerodynamic at all. And, and you know, surprisingly, this trailer doesn't get much more range than the big 21 foot trailer. Um, that looks an awful lot of trailer my family uh, towed in Mexico in 1966. Uh -huh. um, but it's, 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 yours is a little bit bigger than that. Does it open up into yeah. a tent? No, it's, it's actually rigid. It's like it folds up into like an A and then there's rigid triangle gables that fold up on the side. So uh, because we do a lot of camping in places that there's bears, sometimes they only let you camp with the rigid sided trailer. So this uh, nominally <laughs> checks the box for being bear proof, although I would question that. <clears throat> in any event, it's very boxy and it creates quite a lot of drag behind the Tesla. So We've since done some things to this trailer, like remove that front wheel and take the propane tank out and do a couple of other things to try to like reduce drag on it. But we haven't really road tested this trailer very much. So I can't report too much on, you know, the difference in range between this and the, the bigger trailer. But I know when we pulled it back, uh, we did drive it a couple hours after we bought it and it was pretty comparable to, to pulling the much bigger, but aerodynamic trailer. And, you know, what that means effectively is stopping to charge every two hours. If you're driving at the speed limit, which is, you know, in California, 55. So you figure 110, 120 miles of range is what you'll get pulling a camper trailer in the Model Y and, you know, give or take quite a bit, <laughs> depending on conditions and driving style and actual trailer. So um, let's see, here's another picture of that same trailer. Um, like I said, not aerodynamic at all. It's got this big bulky tray on the back. Um, anyhow, but we've been uh, you know, Sorry, what's your question? I didn't quite make it out. The three hundred. Yeah, you you have the uh, the uh, long range model Y, the one that gets about three hundred miles, uh, but it's yeah. not pulling a trailer. Yeah, that's right. I don't... And um, <clears throat> you know, effectively, you could pull it probably one hundred and fifty miles. But the thing is, most of the time, the difference between 120 miles and 150 miles, there's not been a charger in that gap. <laughs> so we usually would stop and play it safe. Um, and a lot of times we'll just stop every two hours anyway, because we need to walk the dog or, you know, make a sandwich or something. 
So I would say like, for those of you with EVs who've done long distance road trips, you know that it takes a little longer than in a gas car because you got to stop and wait for the charging and all that. And to do that with the trailer is like times three. So it's just a lot more waiting at the charger in, in part because you're stopping more regularly, like you're stopping every hundred miles or at every, every other fast charger in like a good scenario. Um, but the other thing is, is that let me get into the next section here. Oh, well, this is locations. What I can just say is that when you're trying to charge with a trailer, uh, it's a much more of a pain in the ass. Um, sorry, if I can say that. Um, it's way more complicated. And you need to take extra time frequently to have to drop the trailer so that you can go charge. And then you got to rehook up the trailer. So there can be a lot of overhead um, when you're doing a trailer trip. Um, I will say, though, that doing it in a Tesla is way easier than doing it on a non-Tesla network, just because I've seen, like, the state of various chargers all up and down the West Coast and the Northwest. And I often see people struggling with other fast chargers. So, and a lot of level two chargers are just unreliable, as we know. Um, let me just show you, we've been a lot of places uh here's the redwoods of course uh we, we've had a lot of fun times with the electric trailer and just also you'd be amazed the number of people in a national park who still haven't seen a tesla not so much in california but you know definitely other places <clears throat> um here we are somewhere in northern california <laughs> on the east side of the sierra I'm not sure exactly where, um, but I think you can see I have, it's probably pretty small on your screen, but got my remote work antenna set up down there. So this was a nice place for us to post up for a week or so. Um, here we are, Yosemite, pulling the trailer again. I uh, believe this is somewhere near Joshua Tree. So here's the thing I can talk about. You can see in this picture <clears throat> really clearly how this trailer is made to be a little more aerodynamic. Uh, and that, of course, was good for the range, but it also had the benefit of helping the trailer, you know, slice through the air a little better. And so it was kind of like a fish behind the car, it was really stable. It didn't sway very much at all, like almost ever. Um, so the, just the way this trailer was able to be a little more aerodynamic really made it, in my opinion, a lot more stable on the road than just a big box trailer. Um, of course, you lose a little bit of real estate and it's harder to build and all that when you make the more complicated shape. But um, this trailer was cool because it also, you can kind of see in this photo here, um, behind the back wheel of the car that there's all this shrouding underneath the trailer to kind of make the air flow cleanly underneath it. So there's not a lot of little pokey bits sticking out that are kind of cause drag. Um, so really they, they did a pretty good job with this trailer trying to make it as aerodynamic so, as good. How much does that trailer weigh? Good question. Uh, that trailer I believe was it was really light. It was like 2,700 pounds, I think, uh, empty. And of course, the weight limit on the Model Y is 3,500. So when it's loaded, you got to be pretty careful. Um, <clears throat> but we, it's pretty well built, so we didn't... I was never really concerned about the pulling capacity of the car. Um, I will say that we wore through tires quite a bit faster when we were pulling that thing all around. Uh, of course, we were on gravel a lot too. And let's see what else. We we were just in some really harsh environments, driving on some really like, I'm a pretty adventurous driver, I think, when it comes to the Model Y. <coughs> Excuse me. And so I've taken on some things I, you know, might have almost regretted. But we've, you know, worn out like one of the front end joints because it was just, we took it kind of on bumpy roads so much. Um, so we've definitely put the car kind of through its paces and 
we've never had a problem with the electrical part of the car. We've had problems with other parts of the car. Um, but the, you know, the towing weight is an issue because like the Model X can tow up to 5,000 pounds, which is a lot more reasonable when it comes to having a, a trailer. Uh, and it also, the Model X has uh, air suspension, which the Y doesn't. So you got to be kind of careful, like how you load the trailer, um, that you don't put too much tongue weight, uh, and that you don't cause the Model Y to like, you know, sit funny. Um, so I wouldn't say it's like the most <clears throat> straightforward thing in the world, but for people who don't mind tinkering with their travel situation, it's pretty fun. Um, this is Joshua Tree, I think, uh, northern Idaho, I think, maybe above the Grand Ronde River <clears throat> here. You can see in this picture how low that trailer sits relative to the car. Uh, it really doesn't create very much additional drag at all. Um, and interestingly, I haven't talked about this at all, but when you add weight, onto the car and trailer, um, it obviously takes more energy for the car to move, but you also have the opportunity to get more regen energy because the trailer is effectively pushing the car down the hill. Um, so if your brakes are set properly, um, you don't really lose any energy to the added weight of the trailer because you get most of that back. Just like if you put a 200 pound weight in the back seat of your car, like it would take more energy for the car to move, but you'd also get more regen out of it. So same thing with the trailer. Um, okay, there's been some issues. Um, this is us with a blown out tire outside of Reading uh, that our tire blew out the night before. Uh, on it's kind of, can't really tell here, but it's sort of icy and snowy outside. And it was kind of a catastrophic blowout. Uh, well, it, just less than catastrophic because I actually had about 10 seconds to turn the car around and pull off the road um, before it totally went flat. And there was no cell service. Um, it was like Friday night, it was late. There was nobody around, but we had Starlink. <laughs> so I turned on Starlink and was able to call Tesla and Tesla was able to dispatch a tow truck the next day. So that was cool. Um, I felt like very privileged to have all these tools at my disposal to take care of the problem. And also very lucky that uh, we didn't incur any damage to our car or family or trailer. Um, so all was well, but it took two days to fix the tire um, because of the the timing and the, the availability of tires and tire shops and so on. Uh, so it's challenging. Lesson learned here, we no longer travel without a spare if we're going very far, which takes a significant amount of room in the back of the car. But if you're pulling a trailer, you just throw it in the trailer and it's fine. Um, charging is a pain in the butt. <clears throat> when you're pulling a the trailer, there's a lot of ways to get creative. I always try really hard to not block more than more stalls than necessary. Um, and I would always move if someone needed a spot. And sometimes we would just unhook the trailer if it was a busy place or if it's a park. A lot of parking lots are just really bad for trailers. You can't even turn them around. So sometimes we would just park and immediately drop the trailer and just you know take the car to go charge. Um, so you have to get creative with charging. Um, sometimes you can use, especially with Teslas, there's like the first charger that is meant for if you have a bike rack um, that you can drive nose, nose into it. Um, a lot of times you can pull up sideways to those if you're pulling a trailer. Um, I'm not sure if I have a picture of that, but a lot of times you end up doing this, which of course you're not gonna do when it's busy, <laughs> if it's super busy, then I drop the trailer and I charge like a normal person. Um, but if you, you know, not dropping the trailer saves you half an hour, probably. And that's if you're, if you're quick. So, because <clears throat> to, to really to go drop the trailer, make sure it's all safe and like do that, 
Um, I'd, I'd say maybe 20 minutes at the, if you're paying attention. Um, would the cord not reach? Them? Right. That would not. Yeah. Oh, <clears throat> these cords are most of these cords are only about four or five feet long. Yeah. So interestingly, I went down to, uh, where was I? I was charging in weed, California. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they had some of the new version superchargers out that are meant for non Teslas. And they <clears throat> had a much different user kind of setup, and the cords were a lot longer. Uh, so it was more trailer friendly, more non Tesla friendly, uh, and would be easier to do this kind of shenanigans uh, if I needed to on those new version chargers. The, the, um, Eugene. Public parking zone. Yeah, but their levels are higher. Yeah. Yeah, these are decent faster. So, like, this is what trailer charging should look like. Do they lose energy having a longer cord? No. Right. You have a big pull through with the charger at the end, um, and Our like good lighting, uh, I think easy stressed. navigation. Um. Notice this is a Rivian charger. Um, so Rivian has put out um, fast charging kind of around the West and it's been all free. I'm not sure if they're charging for it or if they're cut, requiring payment for it yet. Um, <clears throat> but it was nice to see that they had put the Rivian chargers out with kind of a mindset of people are pulling trailers with those trucks. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, they were able to take more truck centric kind of approach. Um, also, here we are, um, I think in Bakersfield, maybe, if I remember right. Um, you know, big superchargers going in so in California, like 100 stalls, 200 stalls. Uh, and when they do that, they always have, well, usually have um, some pull throughs here. But the irony of this picture is that I actually had pulled out, um, pulled through a different way. Uh, then I pulled in this way and that charger ended up not working. <laughs> so I actually had to block traffic here on this one, even though there was pull throughs, just because some of the chargers were not functioning, um, which was unusual. But now that cyber trucks are starting to happen, uh, they're starting to make chargers that accommodate big vehicles and big vehicles that are pulling stuff. Um, so that's nice to see. Um, okay. Um, oh, I think this is the end. I have other pictures if you want, but just a couple of things about towing. Um, you need a brake controller, which if you know about towing from the gasoline vehicle world, uh, will be familiar, but, uh, it's basically a, a way you control the trailer's brakes remotely, uh, and you can have it sync up with the car. And you can adjust the sensitivity so that, like, the worst case scenario is that oh, the trailer brakes. is breaking your Tesla <laughs> and you burn out your trailer brakes and you get no regen and uh, you destroy your trailer. That would be the worst case scenario. The best case scenario would be that, like, the trailer is helping to break just enough and only when you really need to break. Otherwise, it's contributing to the regen of your car. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, okay, so this is a huge thing. The Better Route Planner um, is a website, which if y'all haven't ever used it, is amazing. Uh, it basically allows you to change how efficient your car is in the calculation so that you can get a more realistic range estimate. Um, Normally, I would say like our car is running at 50% efficiency uh, and then plan because if we're driving across the Nevada desert, like we need to know where all the level two chargers are and all the fast chargers and like maybe also where the CCS chargers are. Um, it's getting better, but having a really realistic and detailed itinerary has been like the thing that's really enabled us to do all this towing. Because the the car has gotten better at predicting range based on the, the instantaneous power consumption. Um, but it's still like not that smart about planning big trips in advance. And I just don't trust it. So 
the better route planner is like a must have if you're going to do any kind of adventuring away from the highway. Um, I also said spare tire, key thing, have communications gear. <laughs> if you get stranded, Starlink was really helpful, but you know, I don't always have that. So having a CB radio or a second set of cell phones may be helpful. Okay. I think I've talked a lot. I can. Is Starlink for Tesla? No, it's a, uh, sorry. Stu, um, uh, I was question about what Starlink is. Yeah. So Starlink is. That is what, uh... it, it's Elon Musk's satellite communications uh, company. And it's basically. Just basically a little dish that you plug in your computer and it provides internet by talking to satellites. Um, so you can get really fast internet in the middle of nowhere um, using that. It's not cheap, um, but it's pretty, pretty amazing. And, and that's and the portable Starlink. Some of us have stationary Starlinks. Um, I do. That's what I use for all my video chat and Zoom and stuff. But I don't have a portable unit like Stu does. Yeah, it's the same. I think it's the same dish. It's just a different payment plan where like the, the mobile service, you get less. You get a slower service and it's not guaranteed, um, but you can move it around um, versus the residential service, which is, I think, faster and more reliable. But you're supposed to keep it in one spot. Um, the nice thing yeah, about the for us is that you can turn it on and off for the months that you need it. So if we're going to have like a big summer road trip, we'll turn it on and take it with us um, for the summer. And I, I believe this is a SpaceX product. I mean, this is another Elon Musk product, right? Oh, it is SpaceX. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the big discussion about Starlink has to do with how the Russians and the Ukrainians are using it in their war with each other. Yeah, or not. There are several thousand of these satellites. Low Earth orbit. We, we don't have to resolve that for towing your vehicle. Though. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, well, I'm happy to carry on talking about towing or if you all have specific questions. Um, Happy to address that. I think I went on a little longer than I needed to. No, it's good. Well, I, I do have sort of a big picture question, which is, you know, I mean, your description of towing, I can see anyone who tows regularly and isn't like wholly committed to EVs is going to say, why on earth would I ever try to tow with an EV? It just looks, uh, oh, it just yeah. looks and sounds like, like uh, a pain in the butt. What could we do? to make towing better. The, the one thing I saw that's obvious is to build more pull through stalls. And, right. and, you know, and we've, you know, Lane Electric here, one of our local utilities has talked about putting in a DCFC up in Oak Ridge, which would be great. And I've told them, you know, we would love to participate in the design of that. Uh, and one thing you need to think about is pull through because there are a lot of people who are hauling trailers of one kind or another that would be going through Oak Ridge. Um, and uh, but but what else beyond pull through stalls? What can we do to make hauling a trailer more convenient? Yeah, well, I mean, I think one thing which just doesn't necessarily speak to your question though is that it's an awesome tow vehicle. Like, you don't want to drive ninety pulling the trailer because your range is going to be really bad. <laughs> oh, wow. um, but if you needed to pass somebody going 90 because they were driving unsafe or you're going up a mountain or like you can do it I mean, it's a, it's really a very nimble tow vehicle and had almost almost like i wouldn't say like there's nothing behind you because you obviously people are sensitive to the vehicle they're driving but really very negligible effect on the drivability of the car and super fun still to drive like um I would say that for anybody who wants to go trailering, like there's a certain learning curve and mindset, whether it's a EV or not. <laughs> so like be prepared for that. But 
I think the best thing we could do to really make it more convenient is to have more destination level two chargers, like very prolifically. And one of the things that I have a mind to do um, at some point uh, is to help try to help RV parks be better hosts to charging um, because they're already spread all around the rural parts of America. They already have places to park, power service. They're used to people coming in and out. Uh, you know, they're used to charging a fee for a service. So I think that RV parks could be a really valuable kind of like solution in the in the medium term, um, maybe for fast charging or maybe just for more level two. But once you get to the destination, like it's still been a hassle for us to like make sure the car's topped off. Um, the best case scenario is you get a campsite that has uh, electrical and you can just level one charge for the whole duration of your camping trip. Uh, that's really awesome when you can do that. Um, but beyond that, you know, I remember being at Yosemite and they had four public chargers at the time, level two chargers. And like one of them was a little dodgy. Uh, two of them were great but in high demand and then one was broken <laughs> so it was a little bit of a challenge to like you know go down at night and like charge the car and then you know have to like hike back to the campsite and then come get the car in a couple hours when it's charged so it's definitely like having charging at hospitality is a huge thing and i think there could be way more of that and people ev drivers should be asking for that when they book accommodations of like, do you have charging? Um, you know, what's your plan for charging? Um, and I think the national parks are getting a little bit better at that, but uh, it's, it's slow for sure. Um, I'm not sure what else, like really, if right. it wasn't an issue, it, it would be just great all around. They could make more EV specific trailers. That's for one thing. A stew? Um, yeah. A question, uh, did, in all your travels with trailers, is there any ever any need to get anti-sway bars on the trailers? Mm. Yeah, so we our hitch is a was an anti-sway. You can't really see it in this. Um, well, actually, you can't see my screen anymore. Um, but we That's did right. have um, we did have a three point hitch that was anti-sway. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a little bit of why when we unhooked it, it took a minute because it wasn't just like dropping it off the tongue. We also had to like decamber the anti mm -hmm. and you know, so there's a little bit of a production. Um, that's why we always would charge blocking stalls if we could, <laughs> if it wasn't like inconveniencing anybody. Um, so, you know, and I don't know that we needed that, but it was definitely nice to have. And we, we didn't have that on our smaller trailers, but on the big trailer we did, so. The other, like, one thing I would say is that we, the brake controller I mentioned before uh, is an external unit that you control with your phone. Um, and it, it's, it reads when you press the brakes in the car and it applies the brakes to the trailer. But because these cars are so sophisticated computer-wise, there's no reason the brake controller can't be part of the car. So, like, you just plug the car, the trailer into the car and it has an integrated brake controller. But... As far as I know, nobody's offering that yet. <clears throat> so until then, you need a secondary control. 